Aren't you glad that's over? Well, good evening. We're going to continue our study in the book of Jonah. So if you've got your Bible with you, you can turn to chapter 3, or you can find the closest pew Bible there. Turn to chapter 3. That's where we'll pick up. And uh, before we jump in feet first, let's start our time together with a word of prayer. God, we thank you for, Lord, just being blessed to do business here in this place, Lord, to do the business of your kingdom, the work that you call us to, and God, we thank you for the ways that you bless us in doing that. And tonight, Lord, as we continue to study Holy Scripture and see the example of the prophet Jonah, Lord, we pray we learn from it. We pray, Lord, that you speak to us from the words of Holy Scripture as we dig deeper to see their true meaning, to see where they came from, God, to see how they change us. So, Lord, be with us tonight as we study. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so to catch us up, if you haven't been here uh, for the first two sessions of this study, we've been with Jonah, a familiar book. We went, uh, we kind of talked some background information about what Jonah is, and um, <clears throat> Jonah being a prophetic book that's unlike other prophetic books in that really there is no oracle from Jonah. There's no oracle to Jonah from God, uh, except this thing that we're going to read tonight as the only explicit one. Uh, we read last week probably the most well-known thing about Jonah, and that's his journey in the belly of the fish. And we saw this um, poem, this song he sang down from the deep as he was in the belly of the fish going down. And now, after he's been puked back up onto the shore, we kick off with chapter 3. So chapter 3, verse 1 says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Now, if you look over in chapter 1, verse 1, if it's like my Bible, it's just right on the next page. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. It's verbatim the same thing. It's this notion that, all right, we're rebooting now. We're starting over. Jonah is starting over. There's a verbatim expression from between the first few verses of chapter 3 and the first, verses, or first words of chapter 1. So verse 3, the only difference there is we're not told that he's the son of Amite. Instead, we're told that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying in verse 2, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So again, Jonah is given the same charge. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation before. But, but sometimes when I think about this, I, I imagine that Jonah is sitting there, maybe still on the beach covered in the innards of a fish, and he's thinking, all right, God, I, I learned my lesson. I'm sorry. I, I won't. Like, you're the man. You're in charge. You're the boss. Thanks. And then there's that small little inkling maybe in his mind that says, I know he's not going to ask me to go because I put up enough of a fight already. I mean, those of you parents, your, your kids ever do that? You tell them no, and, they, and then they say, okay, I'm sorry. When I was a kid, and me and my sister would fight, and my mama or something would say, like, now tell your sister you're sorry. And, what, you know, I'm sorry. And then the very next thing she would say is, now hug your sister and tell her you're sorry. Like, you had to prove somehow that you were sorry. Well, here, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah again, and I almost get the feeling that Jonah is not expecting God to tell him to do the same thing. But he does exactly that. Get up. That's the call to the prophet, get up, go to Nineveh. You remember we said Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, that great city, which is a bit of an exaggeration, we'll talk about that in a minute, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So in verse 3, Jonah sets out and goes to Nineveh. He set out and went to Nineveh. Notice there's no hesitation this time. There's no running down to Joppa. There's no trying to flag down a taxi or a boat. Jonah sets out immediately and goes to Nineveh. And we're told it's according to the word of the Lord. That adds some emphasis. That tells us that Jonah's not going to Nineveh only to sort of backtrack and go around. It's he's going for the very reason that God has called him. Now, we're told Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Now, what do you, some of your Bibles say in that verse? You can shout it out, this is interactive. What's that? A visit required three days, that's one way to say it. What else? Three days in its breadth? A three day journey? What about that first part? Is there any difference in that? Um, 
Nineveh was an exceedingly large city. Does your say it any differently there? Exceedingly great city, great city. The, the, well, you know what it literally says there? In, I'm not going to read it in Hebrew because I slaughter Hebrew. Uh, but what it literally says is a city of Elohim. And Elohim is a name for God, or it's a word for God. Now, it's interesting to me because n- none of you have that in your Bible, right? That caused me to start thinking, why doesn't it actually say a city of God, a city important to God? Well, in Hebrew, they, they don't really have um, uh, superlatives. Some of you teachers, English teachers, how do you make a superlative in English? Some of you students, maybe, how do you make a superlative in English? You, you add EST. Thank you. I knew somebody would remember. Right, it's the big est. It's the great est. Right? Hebrew doesn't have that. Uh, the way they explain it is either they double it, they reemphasize, they'd say like it's big, big, big. That's how they would want to say it. Or given this text and Elohim being a uh, shared word among the Semitic people, you would say it's like God. It's important. It's of God. And that was a way of saying something was really superlative. So it also has a little bit of a double meaning, though, in the book of Jonah. Because we're told that Jonah's supposed to go to Nineveh, a city of God, in in the literal sense of the Hebrew, a great city. Jonah is called to go there. Now, the truth is, Nineveh is not very big. It's only about three miles across and eight miles around. But we're told it's a very big city, and that's for dramatic effect, because Jonah's about to go and preach, and, and I don't want to spoil it for you, so if you don't want to hear it, plug your ears, but they all, all of these people hear Jonah's message and respond. So we're told it, it's a three days walk across. Now, some of you said it means it's a three days breadth, a three days journey. There are two ways to also understand that because prepositions are the hardest thing to translate sometimes. It can mean uh, three days across, three days to get through. Sometimes it can mean it's literally just if you started at one end of the city and walked for three days straight, you get to the other end. Some interpret it to mean that if you walked up every road and every street and every place trying to cover the entire city, it would take you three days. Now those are two different ways of thinking. And we'll talk how that influences maybe the rest of the way we'll read this. Now, I personally think it's referring to the width of the city. It takes three days to walk across the width of the city. Because in verse 4, Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. Now, how many of you have something different there? Or how does it say it maybe in your Bible? Okay, again, one day's walk. So the idea that he's still going in. Like he's starting at one, and then one day he's in to the city, right? Anybody have it differently than that? Anybody say something like, from the first day Jonah went into the city? From day one he went into the city? What's that? On the first day? That's good. Yeah, we can look at it either, either way here. It can be Jonah went and traveled for a day into the city, or from the first day traveling into the city. So one gives you the impression that Jonah starts, let's say like Nineveh has a gate, and Jonah starts at the gate, walks for a day, and is day deep in the city. The other way of looking at it is there's the gate. Jonah, from the first day at that gate, goes forward and cries out. In verse 4, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's the only prophetic utterance in the book. That's it. Be destroyed? Okay, same thing. Yeah, anybody got anything else different there? Well, besides overthrown or destroyed. I, like the, I actually like the phrase overturn because the verb itself uh, implies turning. And that's, that's a play on words, as we're going to see in a minute. It, it's a verb that means to turn. So it, the city will be turned. That could mean destroyed, or it could mean the city will turn towards Yahweh. Now, where else have you heard the term 40 days? Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark. You hear it all over, actually, the Old Testament. 40 days, in this case, and anywhere you read it in Scripture, even in the New Testament, it's there. 40 days is not meant to be a literal, chronological time period. It's meant to signal something. When you read 40 days, it's meant to signal this is a divine time period. This is a time period marked out by God for a purpose. So when Jonah utters this, this simple one sentence, 
Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overturned. Notice between verse 4 and 5, there's nothing. Now, that's not just a, an obvious sort of uh, a chronological point to make. There's no, there's no other thing there. It doesn't say that Jonah walked out of the city and they all got together and formed committees and said, hey, what did this guy Jonah say? Let's all talk about it and decide what we want to do. It says in verse 5, and the people of Nineveh believed God. Now, let's back up for just a minute. Remember I told you that phrase, it's a three days walk, could mean it's a three days walk across, or it takes three days to go through the city. If it means it takes three days to go through the city, it implies then that Jonah doesn't just walk into the middle of the city, say this one sentence, and then leave. It implies that Jonah walks into the city up and down the streets, saying this one sentence. If it means he goes a day's walk into the city, it's almost like he walks into the city, goes up to the Capitol courthouse, stands on the steps and says, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown, and then walks out of the city. You see how that's different? So it just kind of depends. And I'm not saying either one's right, and I'm not going to tell you which one's right because I don't know. But the implication is to me that Jonah's going to do the bare minimum. If I'm taking away sort of a character study of Jonah, I'm thinking he's going to do, he's going to take God's word so literally that he can get out of stuff. And he only has this sentence long oracle. And the people of Nineveh, we're told, believed God. That's more, too, than just an obvious statement. For the word believed is a word that's used so often to talk about what God desires from God's people. God desires his people. To believe him, to trust him may be the way yours translates that. It's kind of a slap in the face. The Ninevites trust God. They believe God. And so in their response, a response that's supposed to come from the people of Israel, not these Assyrians in Nineveh, they proclaim a fast. And everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. Uh, That's pretty much self-explanatory. It's everybody in, at least everybody in Nineveh puts on sackcloth. Now, verse 6, when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Now, mine says when the news reached the king, maybe yours says when the word reaches the king, when this thing reaches the king. That word for news is a very common word in Hebrew. It's called devar. It's a word, it's the same, the Greek word is logos, and you've all, I know, heard that word. It's a word that literally means Word. That's what it means. Devar means word or thing or utterance or something. But it's ambiguous in verse 6. What is it that reaches the king? News of what, do you think? News of the city. So news of what Jonah had to say? Is it that or is it the news that the people have repented in sackcloth? I don't know either. It's ambiguous. The news that reaches the king is either the news of the oracle of Jonah or the news that the, every person, great and small, has put on sackcloth. Now, there's a re, again, depending on how you look at Jonah, if this is an old book set in the days of Jonah coming from that tradition, then this story, if you read it this way, if it's based in that time of Jeroboam II, like we talked about, the southern kingdom uh, of Judah and that king there, To read a story where the king responds to the behavior of the people is pretty powerful because Jeroboam II especially did not respond to the behavior of the people. So if it's the news of the people putting on sackcloth reaches the king, that says one thing and tells us one thing about the story of Jonah. If it's the news of Jonah's proclamation reaches the king and he responds, that tells us something else about the book of Jonah. Also, just uh, uh, in verse 6, it forms what we call a chiasm, a chiastic structure. Uh, Jonah, I'm sorry, the king of Nineveh, rises from his throne, takes off his robe, puts on sackcloth, and sits down in ashes. That's what we call uh, a chiasm. It starts in, it forms almost like an X in the, in the text. Now, let me also ask you this. Uh, queen Elizabeth is queen of what? England. England. But you don't call her the Queen of London, do you? Right? You don't call the president the president of Washington, D.C. You call him the president of the United States of America. What is the king called in verse 6? King of Nineveh. 
Nineveh is not the nation. Assyria is the nation. Now that also gives us some inkling of when this story probably was written down. And, and I actually believe this is from the Persian period, not from the time of uh, Jonah in the late 8th century B.C. And we know that because when you write it like this, there's no, no writing anywhere that says in Assyria that the king of Assyria was referred to as the king of Nineveh. It's something you can look right past as you're reading, but you don't refer to the king of a nation as the king of the city. So anyhow, he gets the news. He responds in sackcloth and ashes, a common ancient way of showing mourning. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh in verse 7. By the decree of the king and the nobles, no human being or animal nor herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed nor shall they drink water. Another indication, this is probably from the Persian period, is that the Assyrians did not act on behalf of kings and nobles. The king made a decree and that was it. Persians behaved this way. The Persian nobility was the king and the nobles who made decrees. So anyhow, he makes this one and notice it's for people and for animals. In verse 8, human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Now you remember we talked about there's a little, little bit of humor in Jonah. You can kind of see it there, can't you? Like the king says, all right, everybody's got to put on sackcloth and your animals too. Like, going out in the field, they've got their sackcloth woven from goat's hair, and they're putting it on the cows out in the field. That's funny, right? I mean, maybe not to us, but it was funny to them. I mean, the, the idea is everyone is repenting. So it's not just the men with their long beards out in the street wearing sackcloth, wailing with ashes on their face. The idea is it's mom, dad, the kids, the baby, the cat, the dog, the cow, everybody it's supposed to repent because this is a sign. This is what you do when you are trying to repent for something. Now, it's a good sign. And that's the, the caution that's about to come. Is like we can do all these things and we can, do, we can put on the face of repentance. But that's not the idea. That's not what's important. In verse 9, the king says, Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. So there's still even in the minds of the Assyrians, this is a whole lot like, by the way, the sailors on the boat, isn't it? I mean, they're just trying to figure, what's it going to do? Who's the right God? What's, what's the right thing to do? This is what we should do. This is the God, the God that Jonah in one sentence has proclaimed, and now we are all repenting. Who knows? Maybe that God will relent and change his mind. He won't overturn the city. He won't destroy the city. He might turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. Exactly like the sailors in chapter 1. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, so they're not just putting on a show, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. How many of you are uncomfortable with that verse? God changing his mind. A lot of people are. A lot of people don't like it. If you are uncomfortable and are uncomfortable raising your hand about it, let me just ease your discomfort a bit. The notion that God changes his mind is not that God said, oh, I was going to do one thing and now I'm going to do something else. That's not it at all. What God does through the prophet Jonah and all other prophets is he says, this is what's going to happen if you don't change. And when folks change and God doesn't do the thing he said he was going to do, that's not flipping the script. That's not saying, oh, I'm going to you know, go back on my deal. It's God upholding his end, God upholding God's promise. And that's what happens in Nineveh. Now, I don't know about you, but the, the kind of powerful thing about this story to me is here is Jonah, who never, never wanted to go to Nineveh in the first place, never wanted to be over there with those nasty Assyrians, the people who were after uh, Israel, who had destroyed Israel in 722, and who would have liked to have carted off Judah around the same time. Jonah wanted to have nothing to do with these heathens. And even after being down in a fish, even after being puked up on the shore, God calls him to go back. 
And he's lazy about it, negative about it to the point of where when he goes into the city, he just says one sentence. Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. There's no other alternative. There's no further explanation. That's all he says. And the entire city takes his words as the words of Yahweh. And repent. Now, there's no evidence that Ninevites ever come back around and worship Yahweh. There's no temple in Nineveh. And judging from the rest of the history books of the Old Testament, we know Assyria really did not care for the Yahwist of Judah. But in this story, they repent. They call and they trust in the Lord. They believe in the Lord. From one sentence of a prophet who didn't want to be there in the first place. What that says to me is when God wants something done, it gets done. When God wants a a message to get across, even if we don't want to give it, even if we just give it the bare minimum, if God wants it done, it will get done. And here in this story is also an important thing to remember. These are Assyrians. Jonah has a reason for hating him. Jonah has a reason for not wanting to go. And it's sort of odd that God would call one of his prophets to go to Assyria and proclaim to them and give them an opportunity for repentance. That doesn't really fit for the prophets. But here he does it, and these Ninevites turn and repent and believe in more serious ways than any of the people of Israel or Judah ever did. These Gentiles, these other folks, turn to God. And when God sees what they did, changes his mind, holds up his end of the bargain, and doesn't bring calamity upon them. When God wants it to get done, it will get done. And sometimes what God wants to get done is wants other people outside of our circle, outside of the people that we think fit the mold, to hear his message, to hear what God has to say. And I believe if Jonah just didn't go again, somebody else would eventually have been sent. But even even through Jonah's minimal effort, God's work still gets done. May we carry that truth with us, that when God calls us, even if we kind of fight against it, even if God sends us into the belly of a fish and pukes us back up, even if we just give it the bare minimum out of spite. It doesn't really matter because in the end it's not up to us. In the end, God's will will be done. Would you pray with me? God, we are grateful, Lord, that your will is the ultimate will. And Lord, we pray that we learn from Jonah. We learn from his mistakes. God, we learn that when you call us, it is a serious call. One that even if we try to run from, Lord, you may still drag us back even if it takes a great fish. Lord, even when we are half-hearted, God, you still call us. You still show the fruit, not of our actions, but of your power. So God, help us to continue to learn from Holy Scripture. Lord, be with us the rest of this week. May the examples we see in your word remind us and encourage us and challenge us. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord who calls us. Amen.